Frank. Dear students, dear Frank Fukuyama, uh, ladies and gentlemen, these days everyone mentions Frank Fukuyama in this town every single minute. We listen to him. And that's what we want to do at the Hearty School. Um, it's an honor uh, to have you here. It's an honor for all of us to host this event this afternoon. Um, I usually, I make a confession, have never really liked these commemorations of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I'll tell you why. Five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 25 years thereafter, we just look back. It was useful in terms of internal stock taking with regard to German reunification, but it was largely boring with regard to the overall international architecture. This year is different. We live in a very different strategic environment. And I'm not the person to talk about this. Frank is the person to talk about this, and we have a great panel that will address this. But let me just say two words about why I believe today is so different. It's sufficient to look at two interviews that were given in the past days. One is the interview by Chancellor Merkel about 30 years of reunification, which is a very inward-looking interview focusing on Germany with almost no strategic positioning and outlook. And then look at the other side, which is the interview uh, by President Macron yesterday with The Economist, where German reunification does not appear. It is not mentioned once. Where the fall of the wall, 30 years after, is not mentioned a single time. The only reference in this 12, 13-page interview is one short paragraph to the end of history. That is remarkable. And it shows two very different ways of looking at the world today here in France and Germany. On the one hand, Germany is the country that, and I quote the words of someone who sits here in front, Thomas Bagger, uh, from the planning stuff of the German fellow president, who has this small piece, and Thomas, you know I like this piece a lot, in which he basically argues, and I paraphrase you, Germany has never really recovered from this idea of the end of history. I think that's absolutely right. We still believe it's only a matter of time until all countries surrounding us will become liberal democracies. So there is no need to have a strategic policy to build up a big military. We like NATO, we don't like NATO, they're just there, that's good, so let's just wait. That is the strategic positioning in this very town. Now you travel to Paris and you'll get what Macron said in the past days, which is totally different, which is we need a new strategic positioning in military terms. We need to run in a strategic way geopolitics of this continent. And this is why I, President Macron, am so strongly interested in positioning Europe in a different way. We talked about the US and Europe coming from Mars and Venus. I think when I look at these two interviews and these two statements, and I listened to uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo this morning, perhaps there is a divide arising within this continent, which we need to look at very, very closely. I would like to introduce this wonderful afternoon um, by thanking our partners. We um, co-organize this event um, with the German Marshall Fund, the Robert Bosch Stiftung, and the uh, uh, Thomas Mann uh, House, uh, Villa Aurora in Washington. It's part of a series called The Backlash Against Liberal Democracy. The series brings together influential voices from Europe and the United States to shed light on different aspects of the challenges that liberal democracies face. Uh, other speakers include Tim Snyder from Yale, Danny Ziblatt, close friend from Harvard, and other people. In just a moment, uh, Marianne Heuwagen, the deputy chairwoman of the board of directors from the Villa Aurora and Thomas Mann House, will provide her own words of welcome and introduce you, Frank Fukuyama. We will then have a discussion, a panel discussion, which is going to be chaired by a student of the Hertie School. And we like to bring students as hosts and moderators um, because they bring in this other perspective. You were born uh, at a time when the wall uh, was already disappearing. You have a 
uh, history which is very interesting. You actually, um, uh, your family uh, emigrated from the Czech Republic in uh, 1984 to Sweden. You moved to Germany in 2012, studied here. Uh, and there is no better way to moderate. You're now a second year student, our Master of International Affairs. There's no better way for you, uh, for us to have a moderator from the student community on that, uh, on that panel. Let me just say my last and closing words. First word of regret. Um, on 8th of November, um, there are many conferences, so I have to apologize. I committed a few months ago that I would speak on the German, uh, on the European Strategic Choice Conference taking place in the Ritz-Carlton, um, and I have to be on the panel in exactly 21 minutes. So I jump on a bicycle and be gone. I apologize, Frank, I told you before. I will not be here to listen to your, to your words. But my last word is really Let's get back together here in 10 years, perhaps five, but certainly in 10 years, and take stock. I bet that this year, 2019, 2020, will be remembered as this very important point in the history of the global order, of liberal democracies, and everything that follows. Frank Fukuyama in his book says, the end of history is not going to come immediately. There will be backs and forths. It will take perhaps centuries until we get here. Let's take stock today and in five or 10 years where we are. Thank you for being here. Marianne, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Veda Aurora Thomas Mannhaus Association, I warmly welcome you to this event marking the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. The, I take this moment to introduce a little bit our program at the Thomas Mann House. The Thomas Mann House, as you may all know, in Pacific Palisades, was bought by the German government and established last year. It wants to create a lively transatlantic space for debate where outstanding intellectuals, scientists, or journalists can address fundamental contemporary and future issues related to politics, society, and culture in dialogue with each other and with partners from the United States. Thus, it hopefully will be able to contribute to improve transatlantic relations. When Thomas Mann lived there in the early 40s, he recorded 55 monthly radio speeches, which were delivered via the BBC in London to German-speaking listeners in Europe, addressing such important issues as the roots of fascism, democracy, freedom, migration, and exile, issues which are as important today as they were in the 40s. In commemoration of these speeches to the Germans, we currently organize 55 lectures by intellectuals addressing those issues in cooperation with Süddeutsche Zeitung, Deutschlandfunk, and Los Angeles Review of Books. Two weeks ago, the series was started by today's speaker, Francis Fukuyama. His remarks were published yesterday in Süddeutsche Zeitung. Together with the Marshall Fund of the United States and the Robert Bosch Foundations, we also have been cooperating since 2018 on a series of events here in Germany under the title Backlash Against Liberal Democracy. Hendrik Enderlein just mentioned the program. The next event in this um, series will be organized on the 3rd of December together with the Berlin newspaper Taz on the role of the media in the age of populism. Today, we are honored to welcome Francis Fukuyama, an American political scientist and political economist from Stanford University. Actually, I do not think he really needs an introduction in front of such an informed audience as this one. Therefore, I shall be rather brief. Born in 1952, he graduated from Harvard University where he got his PhD in political science. He worked in his earlier years for the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica and twice in his career for the US State Department. He has been a professor at several universities in the United States and since a couple of years at Stanford University in California. He currently is director of an interdisciplinary research center called the Center for Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. 
Francis Fukuyama is considered to be one of the most important political analysts in the United States. His first major work, The End of History and Last Man, published in 1992, earned him international fame and was widely read not only by academics, but also by the general public. His latest book is called Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment. Unfortunately, Henrik Enderlein just mentioned it, the optimism that followed the end of the Cold War has been replaced by gloom. The West is no longer unified in its support for liberal democracy and a new geopolitical competition is reshaping the international system. What lessons can we draw from 1989 to face current challenges? How should we handle today's uncertainty to protect democracy tomorrow? We hope that Professor Fukuyama can provide us with some answers. Please welcome Francis Fukuyama. Thank you. So thank you very much for that really uh, very kind introduction and for hosting me here again at the Hertie School. Uh, it's very, uh, it, I really um, wouldn't want to be any place else on this particular week than in Berlin. I actually was here 30 years ago because I was then working for James Baker in the State Department and we were in this city probably on November 1st or 2nd of 1989 and the one distinct memory I have is being told by almost everybody both in uh, the State Department and in the German Foreign Ministry that unification will never happen in our lifetime, so just forget about it. And then, you know, uh, here we are. Um, so I thought that what I would do is, I, 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 I drafted an article, uh, it's also the 30th anniversary of the Journal of Democracy, uh, 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 published by the National Endowment for Democracy, and they asked me to write a, a commemorative article that would cover the 30 years uh, since 1989-1990. And I just want to uh, tell you a little bit about what I think are the, the, the most important changes. I'm not going to spend any time on the really obvious one, which is the fact that things were optimistic, you know, back in 1989. It was the middle of the third wave of democratization. Uh, that momentum kept up until the 2000s, but now we're in some kind of a reverse wave. So that's I think should be pretty clear to everybody. But I do want to talk about uh, some things I think are going on a little bit underneath the surface of all of our societies that I think have affected very much the fate of democracy. So there are six items, so let me just move through them quickly because I, I don't want to take too much time. The first is really what was the topic of my identity book, which is uh, a reorientation of world politics uh, from an axis that had been over economic ideology, a left and a right defined primarily by economic ideology, uh, to one that is uh, now defined by identity. And this is not something just going on in Europe, it's going on in many parts of the world. So for example, Modi in India is trying to redefine India's national identity in religious terms rather than the liberal republic that was founded by uh, Nehru and Gandhi. You have a a radical Buddhist uh, movement in Sri Lanka and uh, in uh, uh, Myanmar. And then obviously the rise of a new kind of right-wing politics in uh, Europe, uh, the United States, even in Brazil, uh, that has shifted the meaning both of the left and the right. And I think um, the shift is, is the following, that on the left, uh, inequality, which used to be seen as a general characteristic of a broad group called the working class, is now increasingly seen in the uh, much narrower identity terms, in terms of the specific injustices to racial minorities, women, gays and lesbians, you know, a whole series of uh, marginalized groups, and has moved away from this broad uh, concern of the 20th century, which was really about, you know, the proletariat, the working class, uh, and so forth. And on the right, there's been, I think, quite a disturbing shift away from a, a conservatism that was defined by, you know, defense of individual freedom, free markets, um, uh, that sort of thing, property rights, uh, to one that is increasingly uh, based on these, uh, a certain kind of social conservatism um, that is ultimately grounded in ethnic or racial identity uh, for, for many of these new uh, populists, and there is something of a 
nationalist international that has grown up uh, where Russia has played a very important role in actually linking, you know, Salvini and Marine Le Pen and uh, Steve Bannon and, you know, all of the um, avatars of this particular movement. I think that uh, we fail to see actually these interconnections. So, for example, it's not just Donald Trump that likes Putin. Uh, there's a huge movement uh, of U.S. evangelicals who actually think that they are closer um, uh, culturally to Putin and to the Russians than they are to the Democrats uh, because Putin stands against gay marriage and, you know, for the traditional family and for, you know, he's defending a Christian civilization. And so these are all common themes that now characterize this new understanding of what it means to be a conservative and, you know, needless to say, that completely scrambles the international picture because, you know, the polarity that had defined the, the Cold War is now given way to one that is sort of dividing individual countries, uh, and, but still has this international uh, dimension. <clears throat> okay, second uh, big shift, which is also, I think, probably pretty obvious to everybody, concerns technology. Uh, the internet was just coming in uh, in the 1990s, and at that time, almost everybody, myself included, thought that this would be good for democracy because it gave more people access to information and therefore to power. And I think to some extent that was uh, very much the case. It's easy to mobilize using social media. So a lot of the color revolutions, the Arab Spring, you know, protests against uh, autocratic government have been uh, powered by um, people's access and ability to organize online. But as we've seen, uh, it was just a matter of time before the authoritarians began to catch up and to uh, use these same tools to promote um, their own agenda, which in, it turns out was quite easy because it's really kind of an anti-authoritarian, I mean, it's an anti-authority device, not necessarily anti-authoritarian, anti -authoritarian, but it uh, has been used very effectively by Russia to basically make citizens of democratic countries, whether they're on the right or the left, less trustful of each other, less trustful of their governments, less trustful of their uh, institutions because basically there are no umpires or uh, you know sources of authority on the internet. You can say whatever uh, you want and therefore we now have this big fake news problem where you can't even get to fundamental agreement about facts like does global warming actually exist uh, because of uh, this technology empowered um, confusion that's been spread. Uh, I would just say one thing about artificial intelligence you know, the earlier phases of the digital revolution actually put a computer on every desktop, a smartphone in everybody's pocket, everybody had access to the uh, internet. AI is something that's done, it, it, it rewards scale. Large companies and large countries are better able to make use of AI. And so in a sense, it reinforces the centralization and, and the returns to scale uh, of China and of Google and Facebook and all of the other large social organizations that can actually make use of this uh, technology. The third, um, I think, underlying change is growing social fragmentation. Now, oftentimes this is asserted in connection with the internet and with social media because for obvious reasons, social media seems to be very um, well suited to promoting a certain kind of identity politics. You know, you can communicate with people that are think exact, exactly like you do and you, sh you can shut out everybody else. Uh, and so I think that the growth of, you know, like who, who had ever heard of an incel, you know, until the last year or two, that there's this uh, <laughs> group of unhappy men, uh, involuntary celibates, uh, but you know, they've all found each other on the internet and sometimes they pick up guns and start shooting people as a result of this uh, shared sense of, of grievance. But there's a bigger problem because virtually every, um, social survey has shown decreasing trust in institutions, not just governments, but all of the big mediating institutions, you know, labor unions, political parties, universities, uh, legal systems, and so forth. And this is a cross-national thing that's been going on for the last 50 years. Um, and um, it really uh, has, I think, had a devastating effect on society's ability to organize because they we really depend on these mediating institutions to you know to channel dissent and to you know uh, 
support um, uh, democratic accountability and so forth. Now, on this one, it's a little bit complicated because I actually think that the decline of trust is actually related to some good things that have been going on in the world. So, for example, educational levels are much higher uh, almost everywhere than they were 30 years ago. And I think skepticism about authority goes together with education, right? That, you know, in a peasant society, everybody trusts their landlord or, or you know, the boss of the neighborhood. But in a democratic society, we teach students to be, you know, to question authority. And so this rise of education has had that effect. Um, another thing has to do with uh, equality. Uh, you know, trust in the old days was basically bunch of old you know white men that were able to sit in their country clubs and talk to each other and they all came from the same social background and now we have women and minorities and immigrants and a lot of other people that have been brought into those conversations and they don't share the same backgrounds and so you know the levels of social connectedness are probably inevitably uh, weaker and then finally i actually think that transparency itself has probably bred a lot of distrust because you know, in the old days, you didn't see how the sausage was made. And so you could trust institutions. But now we demand uh, higher transparency, and we get it because, you know, that's one of the other consequences of the digital revolution. And now we look at the sausage factory and say, yuck, you know, I, this is terrible the way, you know, these people in Congress are negotiating and making these dirty deals and so forth. And so, uh, so again, all of those things, greater transparency, higher education, and more diversity are good things. And I think you know, they may explain why you've had this deterioration of trust uh, in institutions. Uh, the fourth issue is the rise and fall of what's called neoliberalism. There's a very nice book by Benjamin Applebaum called The Economist's Hour. Uh, he's an editorial writer for the New York Times, but it's really about the rise and fall of the Chicago School uh, and uh, the impact that that's had intellectually. If you think ideas don't matter, you should read this book because the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions weren't just a political matter. They were also an intellectual matter where you had Nobel Prize winning economists that provided a very sophisticated um, intellectual framework for understanding the economy that had some very positive effects. A lot of the deregulation you know, that happened in this period was overdue and, and necessary, but as we, <clears throat> I think, are very aware now, it also had some very negative effects in terms of increasing uh, inequality in many societies. It, it's led to the financialization uh, of, the <clears throat> of the global economy uh, all of this dirty money sloshing around, you know, from corrupt governments is all facilitated by, uh, in a way, the economic institutions that were created uh, in this period. Uh, it's now fading, uh, and what replaces it is a really big question, but clearly no Democratic candidate is ever going to take the position, you know, that uh, Bill uh, Clinton took or no Labor Party uh, candidate in Britain is going to take a Blairite position on you know, markets being the fundamental uh, way that we organize uh, our economic um, affairs. Uh, I would say that a fifth uh, thing that we've really come to understand in, the, uh, in that time, and so this one really applies to Americans more than anyone else, uh, because Americans were subject to certain illusions that were not generally shared by most Europeans uh, about uh, the conditions under which you can democratize. Uh, and I think actually this illusion stemmed from the way the Berlin Wall collapsed and communism collapsed in general, because I think that many Americans after 1989 came to believe that the biggest political challenge was just getting rid of tyrants around the world. And once the dictator was eliminated, there was a kind of default condition of democracy that would uh, appear in, in the absence of that dictator. And you know, countries like Hungary and Poland after 1989 seem to illustrate that. Right? Communist Party goes away, and then these countries begin to democratize. They enter the European Union. They enter NATO, and it just seemed to be a really simple and easy process, except that it wasn't. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that you know, the United States learned this lesson in the hardest possible way. Uh, in the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, where uh, we expected that we would be greeted, you know, as the 
Baltz and the you know the the, the Hungarians and so forth seem to greet uh, the advent of democracy, and obviously there is a whole agenda of institution building and state building that we somehow forgot about in our own history that was actually pretty important and that wasn't occurring in uh, many other parts of the world. So I really don't think, or I, let's say, I, I hope that you know no uh, policymaker in the West is going to make that mistake uh, anytime. Uh, again uh, soon. Um, I guess the final, you know, I mean, the, the other big policy mistake that I think really influenced our current world, apart from the Iraq war, was the financial crisis, which again was, I think, a byproduct of these neoliberal ideas that, you know, we somehow thought it would be safe to deregulate the financial sector, this came directly out of the Chicago school type, thinking about you know, the, the self-regulating quality of markets, and that uh, directly led to, I think, the rise of populism, because if you hadn't had the 2008 crisis or the Euro crisis in uh, Europe, I think the, uh, the kind of popular resentment of elites uh, would not be nearly as strong, because quite frankly, elites screwed up. All right, so I'm just gonna conclude by saying uh, that I think that uh, I am not completely pessimistic at the present moment uh, uh, for a number of reasons. I think actually that our institutions still remain a lot stronger uh, than they were uh, in the 1930s, let's say. Uh, we'll have an interesting test of this in the United States next year because ultimately the biggest check on populism uh, is an election, and we're going to have an election uh, uh, next year, and we'll see whether the American people uh, make the same mistake twice. Uh, uh, and if they, uh, you know, if they do, uh, I think yeah, we really are in in some trouble. But um, but you know, we'll uh, we'll have to see. But the final thing about 1989 that I want to point out is that the spirit of 1989 has really not disappeared from the world. In the last few years, you know, you've seen popular uprisings in. Ukraine, in Algeria, in Sudan, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, in Armenia. I mean, there's quite a few countries where people get really fed up with authoritarian government. They do not like it. They may not agree on what replaces authoritarian government, but they know that these governments do not treat their citizens with a fundamental degree of respect by giving them rights the way a democracy does. Uh, and so I do think that that uh, spark that we saw, you know, on the day that the wall fell uh, still exists in many societies that, unlike Germany, unlike the United States, don't uh, enjoy that, you know, degree of uh, individual freedom. And I think, you know, that spark hopefully will uh, continue to light uh, more fires uh, in the future. So thank you very much. So thank you, Professor Fukuyama, for this very interesting keynote. And I'd say we just kick off the panel discussion right away. So I would like to introduce to you Professor Alina Munjupipidi. She is a professor of democracy studies here at the Hurdy School. Her research centers primarily on anti-corruption policy and good governance. However, today she can also join us as an expert on Central and Eastern Europe, being from Romania herself, and also having written a book on state building and nationalism in the post-communist era. Thank you for being with us today. And here to my right, we also have Thomas kleine Prokhov. He is the vice president and the director for the German Marshall Fund of the United States here in Berlin. And he is the author of the recent book, The World Needs the West, A Fresh Start for the Liberal Order. I'd say we kick off right there with a question to you. You have in the past characterized 1989 as a case of liberal overreach, and perhaps that the sentiments were a bit of overly enthusiastic. Would you like to explain what you mean by liberal overreach? So, I mean something that, that followed 1989 from it, and, and, and essentially starts with, uh, I would say, the misinterpretation uh, of Frank Fukuyama's dictum uh, of, of the, and the trivial, uh, trivialization of, uh, of his dictum of the end of history, uh, not understanding it as an intellectual concept, but rather as a political reality to be around the corner tomorrow. So we, we seem to believe uh, that, that, that history was on path to democratic, uh, to democratic peace, 
uh, and uh, we behaved as such. We, uh, we, we, we thought the optimism of 1989 uh, soon turned into something that I would call triumphalism. And optimism can easily turn into determinism, the thinking that things will happen that way because they must happen that way. And that way, I think, uh, 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 historical events were, were misinterpreted. When we thought of history was made in Berlin where the wall fell and not in, in, in Tiananmen Square where the tanks rolled, uh, we thought uh, China was an aberration. The real history was the fall of communism, uh, the victory, uh, the victory of market uh, of market capitalism, and inevitably, uh, the, the Chinese would have to come around. And we we constructed policy around this uh, this construction that uh, because the Chinese will come around. Uh, we have to have a policy that allows for them to come around. And if they don't, if they do something, sign on to a norm and don't obey by it, well, a, a, a norm uh, violation we interpret it as deferred uh, norm acceptance. So we just have to give them a little bit more time and we have to make one more compromise and then they'll come on board. I think seven American presidents have have uh, have followed this course. Four German chancellors have followed this course, and you can sort of translate that into how we dealt with how we dealt with Russia for uh, for a while, uh, how we interpreted what happened in Eastern Europe, and certainly and and again, Alain mentioned it, it, it is something that we signed on as Germans. I think we drank the Kool Aid of the trivialized uh, Frank Fukuyama. <laughs> Right? Uh, in thinking that you know, it's a great thing to be on the uh, on on the on in, in sort of in second row, leading from behind on the right side of history, rather than out front on the wrong side of history, as as had been tried. And so, essentially, my generation of of folks would have to just administer the inevitable outcome of history, and would have to make no strategic choices. And I think this is why this country, most of all, struggles so hard with, uh, with adjusting to that new, uh, new environment that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Professor Monju Pipe, would you think that this liberal overreach, if you would also agree with such a characterization, also maybe was the case with the EU eastward expansion and the accession processes? Well, what can I say? I think that uh, I really share the, the view of, of the previous speaker into the fact that even if uh, the end of history uh, could not in any way have been a true statement applicable to all the cases and all the situation, we believed it to be true. And the fact that we believed it to be true, you have to understand that this East European transition didn't uh, happen in one moment in all these countries. Actually, it was a very long diffusion wave which started with the fall of the Berlin Wall, but took quite some years. In my country, anti-communists won elections as late as 1996. And during those years, we were absolutely made stronger in our weakness, because we started from a minority position, from the fact that we were convinced that it's just us who understood it's the end of history, and our stupid opponents just need a few years to get it and then go, go and, and let us, uh, you know, the, the power. And, uh, you know, I can even give a, a very factual example how the end of history example uh, held me. In August 1991, after the aborted coup d'etat, but we didn't know yet if it was aborted or not. In Russia, I tried to go with an American journalist to Crimea where Gorbachev was allegedly held under house arrest. So it just so happened that I knew this American journalist, so we hired a taxi. I mean, it was all very improvised. We hired a taxi in Bucharest. We crossed into Republic of Moldova. And of course, on the way to Crimea, we got arrested by the so-called Black Barrets, the Omon troops, who were extraordinarily dangerous. And we, in fact, had some victims during those days. But that was a moment like this. You didn't know if Russia is going to go back, or in fact, if Russia is going to acknowledge and therefore free all our countries. And the problem was very big, because to tell you the absolute truth, I cannot speak Russian. I grew up in Ceausescu's Romania, which was a nationalist policy, and therefore my generation was the first not to be taught Russia. 
So despite the fact that I consider myself fairly eloquent and extremely arrogant, and I was lecturing the Oman officer with all his guns and him saying, you're out of mind, your coup d'etat has already failed and whatever, I still could not get out of there. But then I looked around and I found this splendid tourist Russian girl, a guide, a 25 years old guide. And she of course spoke perfect English. And in two minutes I realized that the guide also, she believed in the end of history. Although she was Russian, she was definitely considering that the old regime is gone and there can only be one future. And with her help, we really managed to persuade that guy who had already closed us in a garage and started to take the wheels out of the car to see whatever confidential things we had in, okay? And my American counterpart got the, you know, the Pulitzer Prize after, after this, uh, this expedition, but I must say it was such a powerful tool, you know? It was such a powerful tool. Now, where did we run out of steam, you know, in this powerful tool? It was the fact that it be, you know, beyond this east-west question and beyond freedom, not freedom, which definitely, definitely answered itself, we simply ran into far too more complicated problems. I mean, think of, uh, you know, former Yugoslavia problems or the problems that uh, all these Russian-speaking minorities in, in the peripheries of Russia who immediately were very much scared when Russian republics started to declare independence because they found themselves uh, from privileges, because this that they were, they were privileged categories, people related with Russian military, with Russian KGB, and out of a sudden they found themselves living in new national states, so history was definitely going against them, and then they mobilized a lot, and of course they had very, very powerful friends in Moscow, and then we started to have all these breakaway republics, so the situation became very, very fast complicated, but still, you know, I mean, um, Eastern Europe transition is like, um, uh, a map with really very different speeds. And this is how it has to be understood. Today, looking around it and saying that it is all bad is completely wrong. I still think that a lot, a lot was achieved and there's no going back to what was achieved. I mean, think that in no farther than 1998, uh, we were besieged by coal miners, the same coal miners who voted with Mr. Trump, only we sort of experienced them earlier. They came and closed political parties, newspapers in Bucharest in 1990. In 1991, they pushed down a government, all against Washington consensus reforms. Definitely, miners didn't agree that history is, is going that way, right? They were defending their right to exist and the fact that they were told. I mean, I brought my former Harvard professor, Jeffrey Sachs, who, by the way, visited recently to Romania to talk, and I was promoting his work and all this shock therapy thing. What were we telling people? I mean, just understand, we were so convinced that history blows on. We were telling people who asked us, and what if I will be unemployed following your reforms? And we were telling them, well, for the sake of the economy, it's good that you stay unemployed at least six, seven years. <laughs> I mean, of course, they voted us out. I mean, what would you do, you know, if treated, if treated this way, right? But this kind of violence, uh, you know, it's gone. It's gone. You know, 1998 is the last year when, when I witnessed major violence and I had to negotiate major violence. I was at the time the first non-communist head of the Romanian public broadcasting and the miners were again threatening to come to Bucharest. So I took the decision against everybody's will, the president, uh, people from the army who called and the right, to organize their grievances from the Miner's Valley, which is in Petroshan. I said, no, I'm going to send them all the satellite vans. Well, are you crazy? They're going to confiscate your satellite van. Yes, that was true, they did. Immediately they took advantage, but nevertheless they respected my moderators. I said, look, you have two options. We have to air these people grievances. The fact they don't like the way the transition is going. So let's hear them, but we can hear them two ways. Either we can hear them from there, Oh, but the whole country is going to be contaminated. Or we can hear them when again they come to Bucharest, when again they occupy the, the government protest. So there were transitions like ours, which were very much like civil wars. And the difference in the first part of the transitions between Central Europe and the rest of us is that who had the luck of having a communism brought from outside? 
uh, from Russia, like the Germans, or to identify communism like uh, a foreign communist party, dominant party, like the Serbian Communist Party, then your uh, transition was very much like a liberation war, like a national independence war. And this helped very much in the first part of the transition. Countries like Hungary or the Czech Republic, it was acceleration, right? Out with the foreign uh, occupants. There, were, there are memorable pages where actually communism is, is denounced as Russian, alien, foreign, even Asian. It's not European. We didn't have anyone in, in Poland who was a communist. It comes from outside. And of course, this helped them from 15 years. But for us, we didn't have any Russian army starting with 1964. For us or for the Albanians, uh, roughly transition was civil war because clearly our communists have been our own people. Their networks of, uh, of clientelist patronage were with us. And this... Uh, this civil war has never ended, and to end with your European integration, what European integration did for us is that in the end it brought some sort of superficial peace, because even the other guys realized that the European integration is the most advantageous thing which can happen for the country. So after democratizations, which were fairly uh, without decommunization in, in my part of the world, Europeanizations without decommunization follow, and this is why these days you see that they're a bit superficial Europeanization, but that was the price to, to move ahead at the time. Hmm. I would like to back up a bit and talk about 1989 again and how we've interpreted this. So for many people, 1989 and the Velvet Revolution in particular was understood as an affirmation for liberal democracy. Today, if you look at Eastern Europe, a lot of people are saying, yes, this was the intellectuals who led these revolutions. They certainly used the language and the imagery of liberal democracy. But the masses who rallied behind them and who, who were in these revolutions as well, the majority of those people, did they really care about democracy or did they simply care about being better off? Did they simply protest against the status quo rather than to affirm liberal democracy as the preferred form of government? What do you think about that, Professor Fukuyama? Do you think it's possible there has been some sort of misinterpretation, and would this maybe explain a piece of the puzzle of what we're seeing today? Yeah, I think, you know, Ivan Krashtev and Stephen Holmes have just written a book uh, on this subject that we basically misinterpreted what was going on uh, in 1989, that we thought that it was a, a full-scale uh, adoption of liberal democratic values. Uh, and I think that they're right in the following sense, that if you think about lib uh, the, the democracy part isn't so hard because a lot of people wanted democracy. It's the liberal values that are really being contested. And I think it's true that it's not that easy actually to instill liberal values in a population. So this country, Germany, spent a lot of time after 1945 teaching its young people, you know, to be more open-minded, to accept, you know, diversity, to kind of own up to, you know, past history. And very little of that happened in Eastern Europe uh, for a couple of reasons. So one is the one Alina just mentioned, that democracy was actually associated with the reassertion of national identity. Uh, and so nationalism was much more legitimate in that part of the world. But then there is also, I think, this pretense that, you know, under communism, those governments pretended that, that uh, national prejudice, for example, has simply disappeared, you know, because communism superseded... Uh, uh, those kinds of primitive beliefs. Uh, and then there was nobody there to say, well, well, wait a second, we actually have to teach our people how to be liberal and open-minded. I, I just want to make this one little comment about labor mobility also, which I think explains a lot of the, the kind of feeling of crisis about national identity that's going on in Eastern Europe. Uh, once those countries entered the single labor market represented by the European Union, it had these completely, I think, uh, consequences that nobody anticipated, right? So on the receiving side, uh, all these uh, Romanians and Poles and, and you know, Serbs and whatever show up in Germany and Britain and France and so forth, uh, and they kind of provoke a, a big backlash. There, you know, 800,000 Poles moved to Britain in an, like a two-year period in, in, in recent years. And that's an awful lot of people. But then a lot of the sending countries were depopulated. So you had countries losing you know, 10, 15, 20% of their population. Uh, and it was you know, the more educated ones. And so actually, I think you know, this country, for example, profited en enormously from that because you train all these doctors and nurses in Romania or you know, 
um, uh, Ukraine or something, and then they move here, and you get cheap labor, and you don't have to pay, you know, you don't have to invest in that human capital, and that has created a crisis where, you know, if you want to be sympathetic to Viktor Orban, how many, so how many Hungarians are there now, ethnic Hungarians, roughly? Does somebody know the number? It's, it's, a, it's just in the handful of millions, right? And a lot of them, like how? Eight, eight? Okay, eight, eight million. million, all right. Yeah. And many Hungarians have left Hungary over the last 30 years. Uh, and, you know, from his point, you know, he's kind of worried that ethnic Hungarians are going to disappear from the face of the earth if these trends continue. I mean, I'm not, I'm not advocating this position, but I do think that this kind of explains sort of the panic over, you know, preserving ethnic identity that's, you know, infected, uh, you know, many... Uh, uh, people in that region. And certainly with this, we're back at identity, as you mentioned, as a, as a driver for human action and also the strive for equal recognition. And the fact of the matter is that 30 years after 1989, many Eastern Europeans, but also many Eastern Germans, still feel like they are being like, treated like second-class citizens. And I was wondering, uh, you as a German, or perhaps you, Alina, as, a, as an Eastern European, do you think that distinction is real or perceived? And regardless of which is the case, do you think that the governments or also the EU forfeited some chances there that You, we can you mean learn from? whether the, the, the second class citizen uh, thing is justified? Is that where you're going? I'm wondering, first of all, do you think that it's rather just a perception than a reality? Yeah. And either way, do you think that, that some chances were forfeited that we could learn from? Well, um, I mean, first, first of all, I think we, we have to go back and, and in, the, in the mood of the day, we should not forget the successes of 1989. Yes, there, there is what I would call, there's an element of what I co would call overreach uh, under the umbrella of American hegemony, but also there is an enormous economic and social success. There, there is... Uh, um, the, 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 the much maligned uh, uh, liberal uh, economic system actually delivered goods. It delivered the goods in Poland, and so did shock therapy, by the way, um, with Balcerowicz. Uh, and, and that is true across, uh, across Eastern Europe. It's become part of the, the Central European uh, production landscape. Uh, and so it also has delivered to people. Now, has it delivered to the degree and to everybody? Certainly not. Even though we, we now see uh, low, including in Eastern uh, Europe, low uh, unemployment levels. We also have rights for individuals. We have institutional setups. We have security. So I, I think we're, we're talking on a pretty good level of, 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 of transformation that we've seen in the East. That said, of course, uh, something that my old boss uh, has, has once framed a sentence, Joachim Gauck, has said something like, we in the East, we expected uh, heaven in the West, but we ended up in North Rhine-Westphalia. <laughs> so there is, so there is uh, uh, the, the idealized West, and there is the real West. Uh, uh, and, and I think that, that, uh, that process is hef happening in Eastern Europe as well. Uh, Ivan Krastev already uh, quoted here has also framed the second term as the end of imitation. Uh, the, the West was the ideal uh, and it no longer is. And that is th a part of the fact when you end up in North Rhine Westphalia. When, when there is stuff that is just happening and is, you, you don't like it that much, but somehow you got to have to you're going to have to deal with it. So so and that process I, I think is ongoing, and it is a disillusionment that is going on that oftentimes is exaggerated. And the second process that I think that is is going on is um, I, I think that liberal values oftentimes are confused with progressive values, and that conservative values are oftentimes confused these days with populist values. And, and in that, in that uh, very difficult uh, room, Eastern Europe and Central Eastern Europe is maneuvering. I'd be happy to explain a little deeper if you, if you wish, but I don't want to 
monopolize the panel here. <laughs> I think uh, I'd ask Professor Wunjupipedi, do you agree that this is kind of a disillusionment with expectations that's just a bit exaggerated, or, or is there something else at play? Well, first, again, I, I warn against excessive pessimism. I do not see a problem, for instance, of the European Union in East Central Europe, really. I'm far more concerned for what goes on in Spain these days. Uh, I am constantly concerned, uh, particularly since I, I dealt, I work with the Austrian president, so the fact of a consistent segment of the Austrian society keeps voting for a, for a far-right party. I am very much concerned by the amount of civil disobedience that I see in France and the fact that people go out every, every weekend and take Macron's portrait down. I'm not in favor of anybody's portraits up. I mean, please understand me. But on the other hand, you know, to go against the, the guy who, when he tried to put a carbon tax to, and again, take his portrait down, particularly on an issue of climate change, it, it gives the impression that the country is not governable. So I'm really very much concerned for these countries, really. And I am not as much concerned for Hungary and Poland and the Czech Republic that people think. I really think that there is enough strength in these societies when they will be able to have a better marketable alternative to change the political situation there. These countries should not be understandable authoritarian. It's just very good manipulation, a bit of state capture and of economic opportunities by, by leaders who are there, right? Also helped largely by the process of EU funds, which nobody really looked at this, but that's one of the things that I do. Uh, played similarly in, um, in Italy, in Greece, and in Spain. In other words, they always reinforce the hands of, of local uh, autocrats, always, you know, particularly regional autocrats. And now everybody discovers in, in Hungary that this happened before. You know, Remember Varoufakis, he said it all along. He said, but what did you do to make Greece more competitive? They just gave all this money to local elites to distribute through their patronage networks, you know, of PASOK and, and other parties. So I think, you know, the region has come quite a long way. The countries which backslide it are those who take it for granted. Why don't the Baltic states backslide at all? Well, they don't backslide because their existential threat with Russia next door continues to be as big as ever. But if you're in Hungary or in Czech Republic, you simply forget that one day you are afraid of Russian tanks and you think you can afford to, to do this or to do that. So I don't think that, uh, you know, that there is uh, such uh, a problem in, in Eastern Europe. If you look in Eurobarometer, you will see that it is countries like Bulgaria, Romania, or the Baltic states, which have the highest support for European integration. So since the years that you lost some popularity with the crisis, it's been this large masses of largely uneducated citizens in the Balkans, on the Baltic states, but enthusiastic, enthusiastic still about the, the European prospect. Hmm. Thank you. So Professor Fukuyama, we, Professor Pepiti just brought up this kind of double standard that we have, that democratic backsliding is not really just an Eastern phenomenon, quite on the contrary, as you mentioned in your speech. This is something that we see everywhere. Do you think there is a double standard when it comes to measuring or how we view democratic backsliding? There, yeah, I'm sure there is, although I think with the rise of Brexit and Trump, <laughs> uh, there's also a lot of... Um, a very uh, enthusiastic self-flagellation by established democracies about, uh, no, I think that that's actually, you know, as a kind of comparative political scientist, we, we used to, in the democratic transition business, used to talk about consolidated democracy, and, you know, there's some definition, it's like two or three, you know, peaceful turnovers of power to opposition parties, and then once you make it, it's this one-way ratchet and you'll never go back. Uh, and I think that one thing that we have definitely learned, certainly as an American, this is glaringly obvious, I, I just don't think there is such a ratchet, you know, that I think you can go backwards from any point of established democracy because uh, these institutions actually are, even in a place like the United States, you know, potentially quite um, fragile and they're undergoing a pretty significant uh, uh, test right now. So, um, yeah, I think that... Um, I think Alina is, is, is right that um, there, you know, a lot of Western European countries probably ought to look to themselves a little bit more, but um, I think that's a, that's a change that's really uh, already happening. Hmm. 
So last question to you, Mr. Kleine Brockhoff. Um, do you think we're on the way to a different kind of end of history? Some say the liberal order is uh, on its way to die. Do you think it's still alive and kicking? And if so, what can we maybe do to save it? No, I, 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 self-flagellation, I, like, I, I, like uh, I like that term. I mean, there, there is a nature of Western liberal society is self-critique that distinguishes it from all other forms of governments that, that the, self, the critique of it is not part of its downfall but, but part of the repair system uh, of democracy. I think that's what we are seeing. That's alive and kicking. I actually see uh, the ideals uh, that, that that, that guide us in the, from the transatlantic revolutions of 1776 and 1779 onwards. I do not see them uh, in question. Just look at Moscow's uh, uh, liberal demonstration, look at Hong Kong, look at, by the way, mass movements of people, uh, of refugees. Uh, they actually know where the West is. Um, we, we know much less uh, these days, but I think we have to go through a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a reform uh, a process. We have to look at the, the the reasons for what I call the liberal overreach. Have to correct it in an age where there is no American and no liberal hegemony, and that to me m means a more realist, a more circumspect, a more skeptical, yet a principled liberalism a robust liberalism that we have to uh, uh, adapt to in, the, in this day and age. Um, and I'm pretty optimistic that we can do so, even though when you just look at the last 72 hours, uh, NATO is brain dead and, uh, you know, I mean, the, the numbers of, of, of apocalyptic statements that, uh, uh, that, that we're hearing is, is mind-boggling. So I, I understand that it's very hard to keep sort of a straight face, and, 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 but let's look at the picture in the long run. Look, let's look at stability of institutions. Let's look at the viability of, of basic uh, values. Yes, our institutions can, can change, and they will change, and they will need to adapt. But that doesn't mean that the, the underlying uh, system of, uh, of, of principles will, will have to change dramatically. So we can all leave it at what Hendrik said. So we will meet back here in five, ten years and see where we are, right? So now we would like to move to the segment where normally we will open the floor to shorter speeches disguised as questions. However, <laughs> out of consideration for the fact that there are very, very many people here, and I'm sure you're all bursting with ideas, I would like to implore you to please stick to questions, refrain from commenting, one question per person. We will do brief rounds of two or three questions. Please introduce yourself briefly, state your occupation or position or what it is that brings you here. And for those of you watching from the live stream or from the other room, feel free to join the conversation on social media. You will find us on Twitter under the hashtag reassessing1989. I will have your questions here on the tablet and I will then relay some of them onto the panelists as well so that you can also have a chance to ask your questions. So, who would like to ask the first question? Oh, hands going up. Yes, there in the back. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Rafael Blumenthal. I'm a EMPA student here at Hurti. And I was wondering, just I guess an open question for whoever wants to answer it. Um, given the sort of scope of, let's say, a five-year framework that we continuously return to, um, within the continent of Europe, obviously there's a lot of different trends and events forthcoming uh, that can lead to a uh, sort of momentous change in either direction. And I'm just wondering what the panel thinks are particular countries to focus on within that five-year framework and why they think that's where to look. Okay. Yes, Mr. Victor. Thank you very much, Benjamin Tallis from the Peace Research Institute in Hamburg. Um, it seems from the discussion, with the exception of, of Thomas's intervention, that the, the end of history as an idea is really alive and well, actually. As long as we continue to refer to backsliding, to different speeds of movement, and so on and so forth, it implies the same linearity that actually characterized the, the, the article and then the book. So I'm wondering, do the panelists indeed still believe in the end of history? And also, do you see any other alternatives to liberal democracy that you could actually advocate? Thank you. So let's have a third question. 
Ah, yes, over there. So, um, Professor Fukuyama, I want you to elaborate on the second uh, phenomenon you described in your speech. Uh, through this question, uh, is there a threat, and to what extent is there a threat to liberal uh, political order when we have this um, capacity to process data, ensuring uh, or concentration of power, authoritarian power, uh, while uh, ensuring like successful uh, capitalism? Is there a threat in this in this regard? Thank you. Okay, I think that's enough for now. So, who would like to take the first word, Professor Fukuyama? Um, <clears throat> well, so do I believe in the end of history? It, it kind of depends on whether you understand that phrase properly. You know, the end of history was really uh, about whether there's progress. There's been progress in human societies over time. And where does that, you know, where does the arc of that progress point to? Uh, and the answer is yes, I still believe that there, is pro I mean, I think what Thomas said, you know, you just look at where people move in, in the world. They're all leave, leaving poor, uh, authoritarian, uh, chaotic countries, and they want to go to Europe or the United States or, you know, another liberal democracy that gives their children opportunities to develop and so forth. So I think, you know, anyone that says that there's no such thing as development or modernization or, um, or history in this Hegelian sense, Got to, you should go live in Guatemala for a while and, and see how you know you like life there. It's, it's not uh, very pleasant. So uh, I do think there's directionality. The real question is, what um, uh, is there a higher form of uh, civilization other than you know something like the European Union or America in the pre-Trump days? Um, and uh, there I you know have said for a long time that I think that the only real competitor is China because, you know, Russia just doesn't qualify. I mean, it's, it doesn't have a modern economy. Uh, it's basically a big kleptocracy. It can't really master the highest levels of technology, economic growth. China is pretty good at that, uh, and it is very definitely authoritarian. But it's still the case that as a social system, I'm not sure that, you know, people are beating down, you know, they're not trying to cross into, except for a few North Koreans, Hardly anyone wants to live in China, really. I mean, it's not an aspirational culture for anybody, as far as I can see, in much of the world. They like the economic growth, but they really don't like the social system. And I think they like it less now that it's become more uh, authoritarian. I would say the Muslim world, it's, it's hopeless. I mean, that's also not uh, a model, except for a certain very specific type of very alienated you know, uh, individual. So yeah, I think that I, I really, that was the question I was trying to ask when I wrote the title, The End of History, with a question mark, is, is there really something that you can see as systematically better than um, you know, what we have in Europe and America? And I still don't see what that alternative is. Can I just take up on this directly? Uh, well, you know, uh, I give a, something which uh, a UN convention is an example that end of history actually exists and happened, which is United Nations Convention Against Corruption from 2004. As I was explaining in, uh, in my Lipset lecture in DC two, three days again, this is a completely unknown document, but in the other, on the other hand, it is absolutely sensational that you can have over 180 countries in the world who have ratified this document, which doesn't define what corruption is, but define instead what good governance is, and basically spells out the Western good governance ideals as transparency, accountability, consultation in policy, and government, which is not partial, which is based on ethical universalism, treats everybody equally and fairly. Now, this is quite extraordinary. You know, when the Human Rights Convention was adopted, there was a dissident group of countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, which put out a very strong statement saying that they were not consultant sufficient, that the Islamic values were not represented, and that the Western view of human rights should not be imposed to the rest of the world as a universal view of human rights. But nothing similar happened with the United Nations. Nation conventions against corruption. No, in 20 years, nobody protested. There was nobody to say, although you hear a lot about cultural relativism and governance, and this is how we organize things. In this country, we have always given gifts, and this is it. Nobody said absolutely anything. 
Nobody. And now we have basically nearly 190 governments which really would have to be accountable. UN conventions are weak, but it is their own populations who are going to ask them for good governance. And these populations do that these days. You see them in the street in Algeria, you see them in the street in Lebanon, you see them in the street all around the world. So our end of history created very high expectations, expectations of freedom and of equal treatment. Now I am the first to admit that we cannot deliver on these expectations if it is to be us, I mean, if it is the West to deliver on them. But let's face it, this is absolutely created. If you look at these people in Lebanon, what they say in the streets, they say, we no longer want these factions, we no longer want, but those factions actually were seen at the point very advanced as a success in solving their problem, their multi-ethnicity problem. You had to give every group a faction of government, a, a proportion of government, or, but they don't want that. They don't want them. They want the postmodern government based on impersonality in which everybody is treated. This is created. This is out there. Of course, this doesn't mean at all that is the end of human nature, which will remain sectarian, corrupt, whatever, whatever, whatever. But we created a demand. We created a very high demand. And that's why I think that, you know, as a propaganda tool, if you want, as a propaganda tool for, for freedom and the world base of equality, this is indeed still very powerful. What remains for us is to manage expectations, which of course is not easy. So I think a couple of questions I wanted to take up. So the five year time frame, what to look for for change. Well, I mean, the, the most important elections that this country will face uh, and cannot participate in is the American election uh, in, 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 in 2020. That will, will be a factor of change because if Trump is reelected, I would foresee uh, all sorts of tendencies of fragmentations across, the, uh, across the bilateralization fragmentations, also copycat phenomena because if you can get reelected with this stuff, that must be a very successful strategy, others will find. I would call that the Bolsonaro effect, a few, several little Bolsonaros across the world. So that, that, that would be one version of change, but the other version of change would be uh, him not being reelected and uh, some version of a course correction uh, and, and a, 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 a direction towards a new a new normal within uh, uh, the Western world that takes into account the experience of a period uh, of, uh, of nationalist, uh, ethnic, of ethnic nationalism. So as, as unlikely as it looks today, I would see a, a, a likely place where that change come from, comes from to be the United States. That's my, fr my, my first point. Linearity. I don't believe that there, that, that there should have been or there should be a linear thinking. That was part of our, our problem with, with post-1989, and it shouldn't be our problem with thinking about, uh, about, uh, about our future. There is no inevitability of an, of an ethnic nationalist future unless we let it happen. So there is an element of activism that is also part of, of, of that equation. Yes, you can look at the world as it is and as Obama said, admire the problems, but you can also become active and try to change that course. And my third point is I wanna uh, uh, sort of answer by asking Frank Fukuyama a question. Um, um, you said, I don't see intellectually, I don't see the, uh, the alternative. Uh, in, in the future. Well, what do you make of the success of, of authoritarian ca capitalism that, can, that has proven to be able to deliver uh, affluence, a limited, uh, 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 limited elements of freedom, um, and uh, for example, China can build a world, the world's largest airport, a world-class airport with price-recognized architecture uh, within the time of the time overrun of us completing uh, a, a, a small little Berlin airport. So I think uh, delivering is part, of, uh, is part of the equation. And if you don't have a full-scale dictatorial regime that curtails every right, well, is a little bit of authoritarianism maybe acceptable if 
that delivers, and can that be intellectually even for people an attraction? Uh, yes, it certainly can. I actually think that um, when you talk about governance in developed countries, uh, infrastructure is where the rubber hits the road because uh, it's proving across all of our modern democracies almost impossible to build anything. Uh, and I think it's really directly related to you know, uh, a kind of norm that's arisen in democracies that you can't do anything that actually injures the interests of any particular member of that democracy. And they've all got a veto on the, you know, on the broader uh, uh, activity. Um, and obviously the Chinese don't have that, you know, that constraint. But I would, I would just say the following. We actually don't have to be the way we are. And I think uh, it's a mistake to say that either you do it the Chinese way or you just grind to a halt and don't do anything. I think that we actually can make a lot of adjustments in our uh, own governance uh, institutions to make these things more doable, but it does take a bit of a normative change in terms of kind of having an idea of a public good again, where it's not just a matter of managing all these kind of individual uh, uh, issues. Now, the, about authoritarian capitalism in general, I think that the only country that's really managed this is China uh, over the long run. I think that other countries that have tried end up in a lot of trouble because I think capitalism to really work well also does need accountability feedback loops and they need participation and they need buy-in uh, from their citizens and many of them fail to get it. Um, the Chinese have managed to keep up you know, a pretty impressive rate of growth but there's a lot of things we don't know about their future stability. Uh, they've never faced a big economic downturn. You know, since 1979, they have not gone through a recession. Uh, and we don't know what the effects on their legitimacy will be, because it's going to happen sooner or later. Their financial system could blow up. I mean, there's a lot of things that could happen. Thank you. So next round of questions. Yes, over there. I am Mariana Gonzalez. I am a first year MPP student. And this is also an open question. Uh, so in your, like, in your opinion, considering all, have, like, all the things that we've discussed today, what is driving populism uh, in, the context, in the context of this so-called disenchantment with democracy, economics or culture? And also, um, is this generation and its preferences to a strong hand policy a threat to the liberal democracy? Thank you. Yes, over there. White shirt, yes. Mm. Hi, Professor Fukuyama. Thank you for your speech. Um, my question to you would be, would be like, um, say after the fall of the wall in 1989, you had mentioned that there was a rush from all the countries to move towards a liberal democracy and liberal democratic principles. But instead of moving towards liberal democracy, if we had rather moved towards a representative democracy that was also accommodative of conservative principles, there would not have been an explosion of conservatism as we see it today. Rather, when moving together, you might have seen it a little more unified and, and um, less explosion is what uh, is my comment. Would you agree with that? Would you disagree with that? Okay, let's get one more question in there. Yes, ma'am, in the green sweater. Hello, my name is Victoria and I'm a second year Master of Public Policy student at the Hertie School. You mentioned the European and American model and um, suggested that there was no better alternative. And I'm wondering, given the um, extent of the contribution of this model to the environmental crisis that we are facing, I'm just wondering what type of solutions or alternative models um, we need to think of. Thank you. Would you like to start again? Okay, uh, so on the question of is it economics or culture, I think it's obviously both. And the, the two of them are actually related to one another because if you lose a job, you also lose social status. And uh, it reinforces you know, feelings of identity, uncertainty and disrespect and, 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 and so forth. And I do think that we've tended to a little bit overweight the economic explanations because I do think the cultural dimension, this identity dimension is very 
important. Uh, you know, the median income of Trump voters in 2016 was higher than the American uh, national average or uh, median, uh, indicating that there's a lot of people that were not unemployed auto workers or steel workers that uh, voted for him. And I think, you know, if you start decomposing a lot of the motives, it did have to do with uh, certain, you know, um, liberal uh, cultural values also played uh, very strongly uh, in this in ways that we still don't fully recognize. So, for example, uh, everybody thought gay marriage spread across the world like wildfire, and it was accepted in all these countries almost, you know, I mean, at, at an unbelievable rate, and it wasn't problematic. Well, it turns out it was problematic. It's just that a lot of conservative, you know, culturally conservative people just didn't have a voice and didn't really know how to respond to this set of social changes. If you look at what binds American evangelical, you know, this is, it's an amazing thing, but there's a huge number of American evangelicals that think that Russia is closer to them than the Democratic Party. And it is over things like, you know, like gay marriage. And they travel to Russia all the time and they get support from Putin and so forth. And so I do think that, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of, of those kinds of issues. Yeah, what I what I meant to say is, thank you for this question on representative democracy, which I think goes to the core of the matter. But what I meant to say is that we should be very attentive when we phrase it that uh, how are we going to do this and who are going, who's going to manage this. I mean, nobody is in the position of, of doing or managing this kind of things at the global scale. I mean, yes, we have unleashed freedom like the end of history. And I do not think people want to lose freedom. I think look in Hong Kong, how upset they are at the idea that you know history can, can turn back. But then how you organize freedom, it's, we're absolutely past the time of prescriptions. It is rather clear to me that political parties in these new democracies do not get born. I haven't seen any real political parties except Mr. Orman's party. That is, a, so parties only get born on the basis of clientelism, but that's of course not the kind of parties that we like. Otherwise, we have now have a large number of countries which are democratic, where people enjoy freedom, but where parties are not representative. And this is why in all these global corruption barometers and other things, parties have been for 15 years the least trusted institutions in the world. Now, can you really have a regime when parties are under 10% trust and the second least trusted institutions in the world are legislators? So clearly, newly freed people and new democracies are going to organize themselves otherwise, I don't know how, by independent mayors, uh, by uh, Facebook communities in a more participatory form. But I really do not think seeing the kind of social structure and the media and the way comparing it with the time when traditional parties were born, these parties are not going we're not going to see them again. And that will create quite a considerable challenge, how we organize interest representations in these new democracies. So that was one, one point on freedom. The other point on capitalism, which is, which is fairly similar. I mean, we're talking capitalism. I was among the enthusiastic promoters of, of capitalism in my countries and other idiots like me and theirs. But, you know, we imagined that there is something like, you know, perfect markets controlled by somebody that you can unleash out there. But in practice, I mean, what I think really was an ideology, in other words, accepted without critical challenge, was globalization. The idea that you're going to have a global capitalism which works with actors like China, you know, who subsidize and control currencies, and with endless chrony capitalist countries, which in fact, will, instead of market, substitute government decision, but they do play a role in the international market. And we created the monster, and I think people like Trump are trying to answer solutions like this. So, you know, you need monsters to answer monster solutions, but then they may, of course, not find the, the right way to do this. This is truly, truly uh, very complicated. I mean, we're not talking systems that we can control, and I wouldn't even call sometimes, you know, capitalism what I see going on. So, uh, attention, nobody can really manage this. Could we at least manage this on regions or closer to home? Even that, I think, is, is a challenge. Thank you. So, looking at the time, we have time for two more questions. Yes, mister? Thank you very much, it's Rolf Walter from Hattie School. I just wanted to ask you, what do you think about peace 
uh, and our liberal democracies. I wonder whether we shouldn't have, or let me put it the other way around. Would there be a little more engagement with our own values when we're looking at places where war is going on and where we seem to sacrifice rapidly markets against values or values against markets if we can sell enough weapons, if we can support others. So how, how does that fit together that we still have these areas of major wars in the world where we are not taking a stance? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, last question. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, so my question is specifically to Professor Fukuyama. Um, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, we've seen an increase in liberal democracies worldwide, but within these democracies, there's been increasing inequality as well. So the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. How does this square in your version of the end of history as well? Thank you. Uh, well, let me take the last one first. I mean, the end of history was never about uh, this, you know, this is why I made uh, kind of neoliberalism or the Chicago School one of the specific things that, that kind of came and went. That was not the end of history. Uh, you know, my view was not that you had to have these, you know, super hyper-liberalized markets and globalization and, and, and all of that sort of thing. My view is actually more like a traditional social democrats. My feeling is that markets left to their own devices will produce high levels of inequality. Therefore, you need political intervention, you need redistribution, you need social programs and welfare state protections if you're going to keep a legitimate um, uh, form of capitalism. So the two really necessarily go together. And if we had not indulged in this, you know, kind of hyper-liberalism uh, in the period between, you know, 89 and, and the financial crisis, I think we would have seen a much lower uh, level of, of, of inequality. Uh, on, the, on the war question, I'm not quite sure I understand the thrust of that because, first of all, I've never believed that, you know, the, uh, for example, the American love of intervention has ever been driven by primarily commercial uh, um, motives. Uh, now, Trump has made that link very explicit, but, you know, he makes a lot of vulgar things explicit. Uh, but I don't think that's ever what, whatever really drove American foreign policy. We made plenty of mistakes, but it wasn't really the result of you know weapons manufacturers wanting to have bigger markets and that sort of thing. I think it really did come from big mistakes in, in failing to appreciate how, for example, this one military instrument that the United States was uniquely able to deploy couldn't solve all problems. Uh, and as a result, we applied them to, you know, issues that really were required a much different kind of political approach. Um, Mr. Klein Brockhoff, you'd like yeah, to Yeah, I'm, I'm, to I'm that? tempted a little bit on the on the rich poor thing. Now, the first thing we have to state: the rich get richer. The poor, that's that's a limited element of reality. First of all, uh, a a lot of people have moved from two dollars to something of a, of, a, of a middle class in their countries. So the, the, the fight against poverty in, on, on this globe has been pretty successful the last couple, few decades. The rich get rich or the poor get poor. That may be true in some countries, but it's not true in some other countries. So it's not an across the board, uh, it's not an across the board phenomenon. We, we should acknowledge that, that the, 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 I mean, again, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathtub here. Yes, there may have been a Chicago school, Frank, but we also have had uh, the, the delivering the goods, including to Eastern Europe, including to this country. Our Gini curve has not moved uh, considerably, and that is different from the United States. So I, I think we should be careful about generalizing uh, uh, generalizing statements about where uh, about, about rich and poor. I think this phenomenon is is so uh, uh, so sensitive that it needs a much deeper uh, deeper analysis. We have not seen this type of development in this country, I, uh, much as you read it in the newspaper. So I'd be very 
uh, I'd be very careful with uh, uh, with with statements of that that sort. Alina, any last words? Uh, on this, exactly. So I think that the inequality that uh, we see these days in most countries and societies is directly attributable to corruption, not to economic policy. So it's exactly the contrary of capitalism. It's governments who decide who are going to be the market winners. It's not the market. The market never arrives yes. to materialize and be in this. All right? And I think that this is quite, I think, from my perspective, this is the biggest challenge that we look at, because after 15 years of of, uh, of campaign and of selling it to everybody, you know, of raising these expectations that we can deliver a non-corrupt government, what we look at Currently, we look at a world in which the number of democracies which are systematically corrupt are double the number of autocracies, and this makes in total 120 systematically corrupt countries in the world. It's quite a where situation hasn't changed very much you know, in the past year, and where unfortunately, as Frank said earlier, you know, we have a very high correlation between corruption at a systemic scale and brain drain. People tend to flee from societies which are not based on merit to go to societies which are based on merit, and this makes very complicated our task in building a critical mass to reform those societies. But nevertheless, you know, nevertheless, nevertheless, in those societies there is more demand for this than ever, and it's not capitalism which prevents them. I just have some sympathy with the question on, uh, on, the, on the export of arms. Yes, there is a, a, an element of, uh, of Western hype hypocrisy, which indeed is, is very bad on all that, and that we should tackle in corruption and in other, other things as well. But otherwise, uh, if you look at my charts, I have these uh, charts where I show that the world has gone rich, that we have never educated so many people in poor countries before, that in the last 20 years, that we have reduced inequality, only not enough, not enough, that we have created some middle class, but only not enough. So in the end of the day, you know, the only line which has stayed flat for the past 20 years is good governance. That unfortunately is really very flat. So, but n despite that, despite that, all the others, you know, come on, a little bit. So I would say to be optimistic, you know, I'd like to end up with a citation from my husband who is a classical Oxford educated scholar and the former dissident who was never very much into politics but has this distal distant approaches to things and she said, you know what, you know, don't worry, the clear evidence of God's existence is the fact that the West has managed to win the Cold War despite waging it so incompetently. <laughs> this will happen again. But of course we are in a policy school, we try to leave very little to God and the rest will be delivered by our experts here. <laughs> And with that, I think this concludes our time here together. And I would like to thank you on behalf of myself, on behalf of the Herdy School and all of our partners for being here today to discuss, ooh, yikes, to discuss with us. And also thank you to everyone in the audience for a very thoughtful question. And I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you.